Welcome everyone to the Nils Klim Celebration Week. I am Jorun Ökland from the University of Oslo and with me here I have uh, Elisa Usimäki, who is this year's winner of the Nils Klim Prize. First, Elisa will get to introduce herself, but before that I will provide some basic data and uh, give some of the reasons why she receives this prize now. Elisa is from Finland. She has her PhD from Helsinki and her Dr. Tool degree from Aarhus. She is uh, affiliated now with the University of Aarhus, where she has a permanent position. The Nils Klim announcement lists all your great achievements at a young age. Um, and it says that you are an exceptionally accomplished and productive scholar of the literary and cultural history of Judaism in antiquity. In your wide-ranging research, you move confidently between the Dead Sea Scrolls, early Jewish writings and Hellenistic philosophy, and you combine insights emerging from these varied sources in a highly original fashion. You have published a lot, 40 peer-reviewed articles, you have co-edited uh, several volumes, and you have written two monographs, Turning Proverbs Towards Torah, an analysis of 4Q525 from 2016, and this is a book on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Lived Wisdom in Jewish Antiquity, Studies in Exercise and Exemplarity, 2021, and this deals with the wisdom literature. Elisa has received several awards and grants, including a recent European Research Council starting grant for the project An Intersectional Analysis of Ancient Jewish Travel Narratives. Uh, Elisa Usimäki um, is accomplished in her academic area, relying on linguistic skills in languages and philological as well as hermeneutical expertise. As, as she delves into texts and matters that are highly relevant to our historical understanding of the ancient world. Her research topics and her ways of coming to grips with them also relate in significant ways to contemporary global concerns. She has worked in the area of wisdom studies, descriptive ethics and cultural interaction, addressing issues such as lived ancient religion, gender, intersectionality, social hierarchy, enslavement, and several aspects of mobility. And recently she has also turned her attention to women's journeys, the impact of plagues and travel related anxieties. And part of this we have already discussed during the seminar that took place earlier today. Elisa Usimäki's research span is remarkable and her combination of, of classical and contemporary approaches, as well as her numeral original uh, contributions to scholarship are impressive and exemplary. So, in addition to this, which is taken basically from the announcement, I would just like to list, in addition to your monographs, also your, your edited uh, volumes and special issues. One thing is a theme issue, Wisdom Lost, uh, in Finnish. Um, and this is, a, this is a special issue of a Finnish journal. You have edited Gender in the Biblical World, um, which is published by the Finnish Exegetical Society. And you have edited a theme issue entitled Views on the Mediterranean in the Journal of, of, for Theology and the Study of Religion. So these are some basics and uh, some of the praise you received from the Nils Klim Committee. And uh, is there some more you would like to add to begin with about your, your kind of basic, basic personal data? You know, thank you for the introduction. Yes, yeah, so I come from Finland, as you said, and I'm currently based at Aarhus University in Denmark, where I serve as, as you said, professor in, in Hebrew Bible and ancient Judaism. And yeah, as one can get, guess, maybe based on my um, area of expertise, I studied theology, study of religion and Semitic philology at the University of Helsinki, also a minor in Arabic and Islamic studies. 
and and yeah academic careers tend to be mobile and that's also uh, in my case so I did also do some studies at the universities of Manchester and Yale and then as a postdoc I also spent time in uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, the University of Corningen, uh, also sometime in the US at Yale University and New York City area. So, so yeah, th that's uh, me in the in the past years, and and now I'm in Denmark. What motivated you to go into an academic career? I think it's, it's in general the the love of learning. Um, so, so I think that's the the best thing about uh, being an academic that we get to uh, read and write and talk to people and learn new things um, every day. And in a way, I think that so at least in my own case, I think that what I study is, of course, I'm I'm very interested in my questions and the life I have had um, has made me interested in cer certain questions. But at the same time, I also think that we kind of find the questions on the way. So so I could be studying a lot of different things, and and I'm sure that they would be uh, super exciting things to study. So it's also like when you start to to dig a bit deeper and and um, get into a certain topic, that's the moment when you when you find the questions that you are interested in and I think that could could happen um, in many contexts so I ended up becoming a, a scholar of, of history of religion but but I'm sure there would be uh, a lot of uh, other things uh, in the world that that I would also get super excited about if I started to to delve into them let's move over to your work area so something about your sources and your craft mm -hmm. Uh, and I will start with some very basic, simple questions. So, what are your research materials? Yeah. So, my area of research is history of religion in the ancient Mediterranean media. And then my starting point in this enterprise is the ancient Jewish tradition. So, basically, my sources are all possible um, sources uh, related to, to Jewish antiquity, especially in the Persian Hellenistic and early Roman periods. So I'm working on the Hebrew Bible or, or the Old Testament, as well as, it, as its uh, first translation, uh, the Septuaginta, the, the Greek um, Bible. But then I'm also working on a wide range of extra canonical materials, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, Pseudepigrapha, the writings of Philo of Alexandria and Fabius Josephus. So yeah, various uh, literary uh, materials from, from the ancient Eastern Mediterranean. And to many people that will sound um, a bit foreign or like, how do I deal with ancient texts? like that. So could you explain just a little bit about the materiality and languages and how exactly you do it when you encounter one of these ancient texts or several of them? Yeah, of course, when we are talking about ancient texts, they are written on, on languages um, that are not spoken anymore. So so we need to, to study languages to, to be able to read the sources in their original uh, languages, but then also the, it, it really depends on the type of material that we are working on. So, for instance, if one works with the Hebrew Bible, we have uh, the Masoretic text um, of the Hebrew Bible, the authoritative Hebrew um, text, which is actually based on a medieval uh, manuscript. Um, so, so sometimes we rely on these editions uh, that are based on, on later editions. But then we also do have original manuscripts from antiquity, and this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls are especially important, and that's also how my how my career started working with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, so we have uh, fragmentary manuscripts from from antiquity, and with them, there's a lot of basic philological work that we need to do before we can uh, look at the text because they're like also... what? what well, is... yeah, we rarely have the. First of all, there were no books in antiquity, so texts were written on scrolls. In some cases, we have pretty well preserved scrolls, but in many cases, um, or in most cases, um, as for the Dead Sea Scrolls, we actually have very fragmentary manuscripts, so bits and pieces uh, from here and there, and they're very poorly preserved and and badly damaged. So, so before we can uh, read the text, we have to do quite much work looking at the fragments that what does it actually say there um, 
also we may have to think about uh, if we have a bit more material uh, where do the fragments come from do we have for instance damage patterns that would help us to reconstruct the the order of the original scroll and to to know what was the order of the of the text that remains to us so 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 yeah philological work with the material remains mm. so you use uh, you use uh the Hebrew Bible, you use uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, but for your wisdom studies, you also draw on Greek texts, don't you? Yeah, yeah. So yeah exactly. You... Yeah, so so I, as a scholar of ancient Eastern Mediterranean, um, I think it's very important for us to to work on all the material that we have, and and um, yeah, I want to move beyond divisions, uh, say between the Semitic uh, texts and the Greek texts, and try to bring these texts into conversation with each other. And and therefore, um, yes, of course, uh, Hebrew Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls, where we have Hebrew and Aramaic uh, texts for the most part, uh, they're very valuable. But but equally valuable are also uh, writings uh, written in in Greek uh, around the turn of the era. So, so as I mentioned, we have the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, Jewish historian uh, Josephus, and then also in the Greek Bible and the Septuaginta, we have. Um, the so-called apocrypha, so so books that were uh, or, uh, most of them originally composed in in Greek, and that also expands our understanding of ancient Judaism because it was actually, yeah, uh, it, it, very diverse, uh, much uh, in a in a diversity within the ancient Jewish tradition. So so when we come to to the period around the turn of the era, so actually most of the Jews were living uh, in the diaspora across the eastern. Uh, Mediterranean region and and beyond. So, yeah, if we looked at only Hebrew and Aramaic materials, uh, we would get a narrow view of the of the cultural diversity within Judaism in antiquity. So we move on to uh, talk about your tools and frameworks. Uh, you have already said something about. Uh, the necessity of learning different languages and not not just ancient Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So so in a way, language skills is one of the mm -hmm. also one of the one of the tools to access these texts and work on them. And you have said something about piecing together the pieces of the scrolls. Mm -hmm. Could you, in any other way, describe the technical skills needed to? To uh, to approach these ancient texts, are there other things with languages and then? Uh, piecing together ancient manuscripts. Are there other like technical sides of this this work? Yeah. Well, as you say, the the language skills they're really crucial and and decisive in that. Yeah, we can't access the the materials uh, without those skills and and um, yeah, well, we can't rely just on, on modern translations. And and uh, yeah, of course, the kind of Greek and Hebrew and Latin would be the basic uh, toolkit as well as Aramaic because actually parts of the Hebrew Bible are in Aramaic. Uh, which was lingua franca for a long period of time in antiquity. So, so that's important, but also many other languages. Um, so, so we are studying these texts in the wider um, cultural context and also the reception in, in late antiquity and beyond. So, so it's important to, to study other languages as well. So for instance, I did Akkadian and Syriac and Arabic and, and uh, yeah, much more languages could also be done. So, so that's the starting point. Um, yeah, th then it kind of depends on your approach and, and what you want to, to, to get out of the material. But yes, certainly this kind of um, material um, studies and material philology, uh, looking at the uh, extant manuscripts or, or fragments that we have. And, and as I already mentioned, the, yeah, trying to actually read what, what it says and, and maybe reconstruct some of the badly preserved passages and, and scrolls. Yeah, then of course now uh, material philology. It has been a, a big and emerging uh, thing in, in um, our fields in recent years. And this is something also what is increasingly done in, in my field. And I think many Nor Norwegian scholars have been very pioneering in this respect. So with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we actually have the ancient manuscripts. But when it comes to many other ancient Jewish texts, like many of the pseudepigraphic writings that I've already mentioned, so, so ancient Jewish texts that never made it to the uh, canon. So many of these 
are preserved in uh, medieval manuscripts. Um, so, so also there, uh, yeah, we, we can look at the transmission history and it, yeah, one can question how do we actually get to, to, to antiquity with these um, manuscripts or do they tell more us about the later the reception of the, of the material. So, so certainly the later transmission history and, and its materiality also is receiving increasing attention in our field. Mm. You mentioned the term pseudepigraphic. Mm -hmm. Could you just say a little bit about what is a pseudepigraphic writing? Yeah, so pseudepigrapha are writings that are typically attributed to some uh, legendary biblical figure of the past, like uh, Moses or Abraham. And this is, of course, doesn't mean that they would have written those texts, but it tells us about the ancient literary culture. And this is something where I think our field has uh, moved on in recent years. So instead of thinking of this type of text as forgery, uh, scholars like Hindi Naiman have argued that we have various discourses tied, tied to founding figures. And, and uh, then later authors uh, celebrate these ancient figures by creating new literary materials that revolve around these um, ancient figures like Moses or Ezra or uh, David. So th the Corpus Corpus would be Krafa, contains all types of uh, ancient literature, but, but yeah, in many cases, um, there is this uh, focus on some ancestral uh, figure and kind of expanding the lore around that figure. Mm. Another tool in your toolbox is the historical critical method. This is something that everyone studying biblical studies has to start with. So could you also say a few words about what is the historical critical method? Yeah, so the historical critical method, it is, as you say, kind of the basic toolkit uh, that we uh, start with. And typically the aim of historical critical method is to understand the ancient text in its original context. Um, and also the, the kind of birth of the ancient text. So, so there is often focus on text history, compositional history, how the, comparing different types of textual variants that we might have, but also the redaction history of the text. Uh, usually the products that we have, they are a, a result of a very long process of, of editing and rewriting and, and um, yeah, selecting material. So, so trying to understand how the text that we have came to exist, but then also other types of questions related to the ancient um, yeah, social realities uh, from where the text emerged, what could have been the original Sitz im Leben, uh, life setting where, where this type of text was used or, or doing comparative work between, say, an ancient Jewish text or ancient Israelite text and, and other texts from a neighboring culture uh, from the Near East, for instance, and, and trying to see how how um, some traditions found in Jewish texts, uh, uh, oh, oh, yeah, what, what do they look like when we when we study them in the in the broader ancient Mediterranean context? Sometimes today the historical critical method is uh, compared to to more what some would say. Contextual approaches such as um, post-colonial or feminist or other newer ways of of reading ancient literature, but but of course many would also contest that distinction because it gives the impression as if the historical critical method wouldn't have any any context, and it also comes from a particular context. So, so from the post-enlightenment uh, uh, Germany, where the kind of academic critical study of the Bible began. Hmm. You emphasize many times in your uh, written works that you work on Second Temple Judaism. Mm -hmm. what, what would be the time uh, period of Second Temple Judaism, and and how do you set the the, the when does it begin, mm -hmm. and when does it end? So what what yeah. and and it's the writings in this period that interest you the most. So the term Second Temple Judaism is the term that scholars would use in Jewish studies or biblical studies, but we're basically talking about Persian, Hellenistic and early Roman periods. So in the history of Judaism, the Second Temple period begins after the Babylonian exile in the 6th century uh, BCE when the Persians take over and the Jews are, or, or Judahites are able to return from Babylon to the home country and rebuild the temple and that's now the second temple so the first one was was destroyed by the Babylonians before the 
uh, exile. And during the Second Temple period, uh, the Jews are under foreign rule, first uh, Persians. Then during the Hellenistic period, sometimes the uh, area of, of Palestine is under Seleucid rule, sometimes under Ptolemaic rule. There is a short period of independence, the so-called Hasmonean state. Um, but, but yeah, also then Romans uh, come and, and, and take over. And then the Second Temple period ends in 70 CE when the Second Temple of Jerusalem is destroyed in the uh, Jewish uh, war, the, the Jewish revolt against uh, Rome. Yeah. So, so that's the yeah, the time period that I mostly move on. Sometimes a bit, a bit before and and after as well. But, but yeah, for the most part. Um, yeah, and this destruction is then described in one of your main sources, Josephus. Uh, or one one source that you have engaged a lot with, and um, the end of the, the the when when the temple was destroyed. Yeah, and we have different types of accounts. So Josephus gives us the kind of historical context and historical account of the event, but then we also have uh, apocalyptic texts, for instance, uh, for the Ezra second Baruch, that in different ways reflect the the destruction of of um, yeah Jerusalem. So so we do have texts representing different literary genres that that. Um, deal with the with the yeah trauma yeah we also see in the in the new testament mm -hmm. that some writings are written before the fall of the temple and some are written after the fall of the temple and we yeah. although it is not addressed as directly we see the difference between those writings that are part of second temple judaism and those that come later yeah exactly yeah so early jesus movement it's part of the second temple jewish landscape so the parting of the ways between Judaism and Christianity that took hundreds of, of years and and um, yeah certainly when we're talking about the first century uh, CE this is the second temple of Judaism it's also the the matrix for the for the early Jesus movement and the emerging uh, Christianity you mentioned many uh, different sources different many different strands of of, of movements in this period when you study these materials, um, how, how uh, does a study, as you describe it, translate into academia, into, for example, academic jobs, academic projects? How do you find your kind of uh, life as a professor in a, in a university? Uh, how does your study fit into the progress of the university. Yeah, well, I mean, in a way, uh, greatly in that I have, I can have collaborations to to many directions. Um, I have uh, much in common with people who, who study the ancient Near East and and early ancient Israelite tradition. Uh, but then also my research uh, in Second Temple Judaism ties in with with um, say yeah emerging Christianity and and late antiquity and. And the later later Jewish tradition there. Um, so, from an academic or research perspective, it's very rich because there are so many conversations um, to many directions that are relevant to me. But then, of course, it can also be a, a challenge in that the job market tends to be more conservative than the uh, research, um, uh, say, bodies of research funding. So, if if we want to. Uh, do research, of course, uh, yeah, oh, th that's how I was uh, trained in Helsinki. I was encouraged to, to go for the new things and, and uh, yeah, deconstruct canonical boundaries and work with the material where it's possible to say uh, new things. And, and that's, of course, something that if you want to win research funding, so, so if you're working on some new material, um, it's usually, uh, it, it might be easier to, to sell than, than some text that has already been studied for, uh, yeah, uh, hundreds of years from particular uh, uh, perspectives. But, but then, um, yeah, when it comes to the job market, so, so in our field, there is still a lot of positions w where there is a lot of emphasis on the uh, text that later ended up in the, in the canon. So, of course, in antiquity, there were no fixed canons, but then in the later the Jewish and Christian traditions, we have various canons, and, and the yeah, canons of the Old Testament and the New Testament are often, often um, uh, yeah, play a special role uh, in, in recruitment. So, 
So one could say that, yeah, the, the research and the structure structures at universities, they don't always support each other. So that in a way you could say that the, the job market favororizes the established canon and, and the research councils it, it, it favor does. The... Yeah, and that's also, I was really worried at some point that I would never have a job because, um, yeah, I, I did study what, what I found interesting and not in a very yeah, strategic way of thinking how to maximize my, my chances of getting a job in terms of the topic that I'm studying. And I remember having conversations about this with friends and, and colleagues. And then one of my um, yeah, friends said to me that, well, but I mean, is it worth like studying something uh, just to, in order to maximize your, your chances of getting a job? And and w what if you study it for, for five years and then you still don't have a job because there are not many jobs in our field? So so then I also thought that it's, um, yeah, it's better to, to, to take risks and, and focus on on the themes and topics that I'm I'm truly interested in and whether I'll have a job one day, we'll see. But but yeah, things worked out and, and I'm very happy in my job. And it's also, I mean, there is a lot of interesting uh, research going on regarding the canonical texts, but it's just what I want to, to do is to bring all these materials into conversation with each other and, and not to value certain texts more than, than others uh, just because of their later status in in uh, religious communities. So, so as a researcher, as a scholar of antiquity, all, all sources are of equal value to me. And, and um, when I have a research question, I, I study those texts that, that help me answer the, the research question. The term canonical and canon has emerged several times already, and I'm sure it will also <laughs> later on in our discussion. So could you just take a minute to to clarify what exactly the issues around canon and canonization are, and what are the what, what are the the canonized writings that are first and foremost taught at at conventional universities? Yeah. So what are we talking about here? <laughs> yeah. So canon, of course, means a collection of authoritative uh, writings. So so when it comes to Judaism, it's the Hebrew Bible, and then of course rabbinic literature is also extremely important for the uh, Jewish tradition uh, later on. And then in the case of Christianity, it's the, the Bible consisting of the Old Testament and the New Testament, although we should remember that there are actually many different canons, so different Christian uh, groups and denominations have, have slightly different canons also today, so it's not fixed in that sense. But, but I guess... Um, this is something where the Dead Sea Scrolls have been, again, super important, uh, changing our understanding of the, the status of the Hebrew canon around the turn of the era and, and in antiquity. So they have demonstrated to us that that the canonization process had not come to an end. So so there was some kind of uh, idea of, a, of authoritative uh, collection of texts uh, that was uh, gradually emerging and, and being established, but but in antiquity, there was no idea of canon as a fixed uh, entity. So, so we can see that different Jewish groups had slightly different collections of texts that they regarded as important. And, and also the, when we look at individual texts that were regarded as, as authoritative, so they, their text forms uh, also fluctuate. So as a textual entity, the, the canon is not, not fixed yet. Um, and when it is, um, that's a good question. Still in the second century CE, we have discussion on on, on the status of certain books um, now belonging to the Hebrew Bible. But also many would say that even, even after that, um, Jewish authors seem to be operating with a with an implicit uh, kind of canon and, and actual kind of list of of canonical texts uh, that actually comes from the Christian tradition. So Athanasius in in late antiquity. That's where we have a first list of these texts belong to uh, to the canon. But then I don't know. This goes beyond my expertise. But but my um, colleagues in early Christian uh, studies would say that also in the Christian tradition it is more open ended after that. So for instance, if we look at medieval manuscripts, we see all kinds of combinations of of texts. But, but yeah, well, it's clear to us that uh, a canon was not an operative uh, concept for for um, ancient Jews. It's a historical construct, and uh, it's not a meaningful 
way for us to organize our material if we want to understand the diversity and richness of the textile landscape in, in Jewish antiquity. The later canon texts that later ended up in the canon, they give us a, a very uh, narrow view of the textile production um, in the yeah, so-called Second Temple period. Mm. Still today, um, some scholars would say that canon is not a definition of, of uh, selected writings that are authorized, but canon is a genre. Because evidently, for example, also in the Christian tradition, there are so many canons around, like the Ethiopic, the, the, the Eastern Orthodox, the mm -hmm. Catholic, the Protestant, etc. So that it's not like one thing, but it's, a, it's more a genre. So what would you say to such, a, to such a claim or statement, a definition? Well, in that, it's, it, in that sense, it makes sense that, of course, canon is not something that matters only in the context of uh, studying religion, uh, where canons uh, consist of sacred scriptures. But, but I was recently attending an event at the Aarhus Institute of Advanced Studies, and uh, the topic was kind of rethinking classics. And, and it led into a very interesting conversation about uh, canons. Um, and I also realized this, this question questions are also something that, that I ask it in, in um, our postmodern era, in many other fields as well, say in classics or in, in philosophy, that what kind of uh, canons do we have and, and what kind of material we select to, to uh, when the students enter the, the field, what, what are the key, key um, works to um, study and, and how our selection of material then affects the way in which they, they see the, um, the field. So, so yeah, in that sense, canon is of course something that, um, yeah, it's not just about, yeah, collection of, of authoritative scripture in religious context. Let's move on to um, a new uh, part of this interview. Uh, namely your intellectual biography. Um, at a young age, you have managed to publish a lot of substantial original research. And this is the main reason why you got the Niels Klim Prize, of course. Um, but how and where did it all start? Uh, could you take us through how you developed as a scholar and where you are today? Um, how did you end up working on the scrolls? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. Also, um, yeah, the, I've already told maybe bits and pieces, but to put it to some kind of narrative form, um, to to some extent, it's it's random. Uh, to some extent, it makes sense how I ended up there. First of all, I I didn't I wasn't planning to to become a scholar of. Uh, religion of history. No, I didn't plan to become a scholar of history of religion. So when I went to gymnasium, I went to like natural sciences track and I was completely doing other things and, and it was only in the, in the end of gymnasium that I thought, okay, now I first do what I'm really interested in and then later on I'll have time to do something more sensible. So I was supposed to do just a couple of years of, I was originally interested in comparative science of religion. But then uh, when I went to university, I got really into Hebrew uh, during the first year of study. And that's why I, I decided to, to pursue that path instead. Um, I was originally very interested in wisdom literature already as a, as a student. But there was, in Finland, you write your master's thesis as part of seminar. And there was a seminar on wisdom literature, but it was unfortunately one year before I could go to the seminar. So I was not able to attend that. And then the year when I was attending uh, MA seminar, the topic was Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, so, so I went there and ended up working on one previously unknown manuscript, which is also a, a type of wisdom instruction from antiquity, but previously unknown. So, so yeah, for 2000, for 2000 years, it was um, forgotten before it was found. And then uh, at or nearby Gomran. And yeah, that, that's how I ended up working uh, in the scrolls. I think the reason, why there was a, such a seminar uh, was that in Helsinki, there had been since 1990s um, a fair amount of, of scholars working on the scrolls, but there was still also work to do. So we were also translating this text into Finnish uh, for the first time. So, so it was a 
we kind of got involved with the with the research groups in in Helsinki early on and and then after that I had a feeling that I I just don't know enough about this I need to go deeper and and I yeah moved on to to my PhD and continued to to work with the uh did see scrolls it was at that time, I had a th an idea that my PhD would be a bit more thematic and have several texts with which I would work. But then I was, yeah, studying in Helsinki and then also in, in Manchester and Yale. And I was actually told that, no, you should I should first do a philological analysis, a close reading of one ancient manuscript that has not been studied in such detail before. And then later on, I could do something more thematic and what I would want. And yeah, I was quite young at the time. And, and then I thought that, okay, well, this is how you how you become a scholar in that context. I I kind of, yeah, uh, ha had to be able to demonstrate my, my skills in this kind of uh, philological work and historical critical research. And I did love um, the time when I did my PhD, so so it was very uh, yeah rewarding. I loved to to be in libraries and and yeah read and write and and it was very motivating in that respect. But then I did also think about it during the PhD that is this the type of work I would like to spend my whole life on, and and also came to to question that, but. But I was also doing my PhD, um, yeah, abroad for a couple of years, and and there I I was able to follow uh, courses uh, taught by professors who have very different approaches to 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 the ancient sources, and and I think that was very uh, rich experience, and and I so somehow realized that the spectrum of questions uh, one could pose or the spectrum of approaches one could take, and and um, yeah, then I decided when I was done with my with my um, uh, PhD that I want to move on to something a bit more conceptual and, and thematic. And, and I had developed this interest in the figure of the sage, so, so the wise person, um, because there has been so much focus on, on wisdom as a category of literature or as a genre. But, but when I was reading the sources, I saw that we have all these uh, kind of ideal embodiments of, of wisdom, uh, wise figures. And, and I also wanted to move to a more kind of cross-disciplinary and cross-cultural study of the of the ancient Jewish literature. So I wanted to study the uh, Jewish text in the wider Mediterranean context, and then this re led me to to my kind of postdoc uh, project. Um, and then the outcome of this project is my my second book, Lived Wisdom, where I try to to look at wisdom as something lived and practiced and, and embodied. So, so not to think about what is wisdom or how to define wisdom text as a literary genre, but, but to ask questions like, what is a wise person like? How does one become wise? Um, uh, how does one perform one's wisdom? And also during these years, I, I developed uh, an interest in kind of descriptive ethics and ancient Jewish virtue discourses. And these two, uh, yeah, lived wisdom and, and virtue discourses they kind of closely intertwine so I I, um, I I guess yeah I ended up developing a new way of, of looking at um, ancient Jewish uh, wisdom material or material that uh, discusses wisdom um, as, as something yeah lived embodied and and performed so in your work on wisdom you mentioned uh, descriptive ethics yeah. and I wondered if you could just explain a little bit what descriptive ethics is and in the ancient context and and also the way you have worked on ethics and in in the ancient Mediterranean and uh, and uh, I know that you know I some people have kind of questioned whether you can really compare Ben Sira one of the mm -hmm. one of one one of your key writers there with with, for example, uh, equivalent uh, authors in, for example, uh, uh, Greek, uh, Greek non-Jewish mm -hmm. um, uh, literature. 
Yeah. So first to, to start with the question of descriptive ethics. So so why I say descriptive ethics is it's because I want to signal that my work on ancient ethical traditions, it's um, descriptive, not normative. So I'm not uh, making any claims on, on how people should or should not uh, uh, live today or, or what they should uh, take out of the, those texts, if anything. But, but I'm more interested in the ancient Jewish tradition and its ideas of, of uh, virtue and the good life and ideal ways of living from a, from a descriptive kind of historical uh, perspective. So th that's, um, yeah, that, that's the key starting point. And then of course, this whole question of, of uh, why study ethics in the context of Jewish antiquity, or does it make sense? So of course, this is also uh, it, it depends on, or, or, or yes, uh, we can, but it means different things in different contexts. So, so if we are talking about the Jews who operated in Hebrew and Aramaic in the Semitic languages, so they don't, of course, have a meta category for for ethics, or they don't have a meta category meaning a virtue like arete in uh, Greek or, or virtus in in Latin. But the fact that they don't have certain uh, Categories that we find find in the Greco-Roman uh, tradition doesn't mean that they wouldn't have been concerned with the questions of of um, uh, ethics and the good life, and and this is also where we we need a descriptive approach to try to to understand the culture in its own terms and what kind of uh, idiom does it use to talk about um, these things, and yeah. So so in a way, what I hear you're saying is that. If you, if you want to have a good life, you need to be a good person. And the wisdom literature teaches you to be a good person and then have a good life. Yeah, in the sense that the, it is often quite, um, the, it, it's a literature that describes ideas. Uh, it describes ideas, social realities, how um, it, it gives us various, um, uh, accounts of things that one should pursue and there is this formative element uh, into it or formative aspect to it. So so it is um, formative, idealistic, maybe even perfectionist uh, at, at times. So, so certainly there is that element of aspiration um, which is, yeah, decisive or crucial to it. Yeah. Then the other question concerned um, comparison and what can we compare? Um, I think that we can uh, compare uh, anything. Of course, we, we get different things out of comp comparison of different things, but but like why I think it makes sense to compare, uh, say, Jewish uh, materials with uh, Greek materials or, or some materials from the ancient Near East. So, so um, the Jewish tradition was never isolated from its wider cultural milieu in the ancient Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, there were trade routes, uh, people would move around, ideas would move around, objects would move around. Um, so, so to me, it would seem artificial uh, uh, not to look at that uh, comparative material we have from, from different um, uh, yeah, cultures or, or neighboring um, areas. So, so we can certainly compare and we should compare if we want to get the bigger picture and, and, and see how, how, uh, how the Jewish tradition fits to it. And, and the purpose of comparison, it's not just about, I don't know, maybe some people when they hear the word com comparative work, they might think of um, the simplistic models of influence, like did this uh, tradition influence the, the Jewish thinking or, or not? But, but I don't think um, it's not primarily about uh, influence, but it's about seeing various uh, parallels or similarities as well as dissimilarities. So, so it helps us see how, uh, say, traditions in the ancient Eastern Mediterranean, how they might uh, Remind each uh, resemble how they might resemble each other in certain respects, but then it also highlights the differences. Uh, what are maybe the yeah distinctive emphasis in um, in different traditions? Hmm. And now you have a new project. Yeah, so after these um, kind of two bigger projects, first on the scrolls and then on the wisdom tradition, I moved on to work on travel and mobility in antiquity. 
And this also, yeah, kind of flows from my from my previous expertise in that I try to study a, a wide array of, of materials. Um, uh, yeah, canonical, extra canonical texts, uh, writings in, in Greek, but also in Semitic languages and so forth. And, and I first started to think about travel when I was uh, writing an article on, on stages and, and educational travel in antiquity, because we have some references to how people are said to gain wisdom or knowledge or understanding by means of travel. And then I was presenting this work to, to colleagues at the Helsinki College for Advanced Studies, where I worked before. And then I remember an anthropologist came to talk to me afterwards, and, and she was just curious to know me about, like, yeah, would women, for instance, move because of marriage? And, and yeah, questions that she had been thinking about in, in completely uh, other yeah, contemporary uh, contexts. And then that prompted me to really look at the yeah, social variety or, or complexity of the phenomenon because yeah, educational travel, it's an elite uh, practice and not accessible to, to anyone. So then I wanted to think about uh, travel in all its social complexity. And I had also been developing an interest in um, gender. I mean, I had always been interested in, in questions of uh, gender, but then maybe the reason why I hadn't started to work on that before was that I had always had the feeling that uh, gender, it's very interesting, but alone, it doesn't explain so much alone. And then I had come across uh, intersectionality. And, and this is where I really thought that um, it's helpful because it takes gender into consideration, but it also takes into consideration uh, many other differences between human beings. And, and I saw there are a lot of interpretative potential. And, and this is also something that, um, yeah, in my field, these approaches are emerging, of course, in social sciences, um, the study of contemporary world, they've been around for, uh, for a long time already, but in my field, it's, it's, um, yeah, really emerging and, and yeah, some of the pioneers really come from, from Norway in this respect as well, like Marianne Bjelang also in Oslo. So, so then I thought that I would combine these two, intersectionality and travel, and, and I, um, yeah, worked on a, 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 on a, yeah, major funding application for, for half a year, basically, and, and, um, yeah, then that turned out to be success, successful. So I was able to, to move on to this new project, but it's still, still relatively early uh, for me. So I, it started last year in February 2021, and it's funded by the European Research Council and will run for, the, for, a, fi for a period of five years. So, so yeah, in this project, I, I study literary and cultural representations of travel and movement in ancient Jewish literature, but it's not just me. So I actually have a team. Uh, I'm very lucky to have a team and, and we have a little bit different expertise in the team. So I also learn much from my uh, postdocs and, and PhD students. So I have a PhD student who is studying um, freedom of mobility in the, in the ancient world. She has a background in, in literature as well as in biblical studies. Then I have postdocs who have background in the study of religion and classics and and uh, theology history. So, so they're also um, studying different aspects of travel in, uh, especially in the Greco-Roman, uh, uh, in the Greco-Roman period in the Jewish tradition. So, so my own, I have several, uh, there are several work packages in the project and I have several um, ongoing uh, publication projects, but my main contribution in this context will be a, a, a more in-depth study on, on women's mobility in the ancient world. Hmm. A heading for your work um, that I have seen uh, uh, used in many, in many contexts is literary and cultural history of Judaism from the Persian to the Roman uh, period. Um, so um, I, uh, I see it as somehow implicit in your work that all Second Temple Judaism is Hellenistic Judaism. Yeah, well, in the sense that, so, so Second Temple period, it's a relatively long period from the Persian um, period to, to, to the Roman period. But then, yeah, much of this um, it, it is, is Hellenistic period in the middle, although in the beginning and end we also have other periods. But, but yeah, of course, the, the Hellenistic culture, when it comes to late Second Temple Judaism, so, so the 
the presence of, of the Hellenistic culture is felt everywhere. So in that sense, one could say that that all its second temple Judaism is is Hellenistic um, uh, Judaism in one way or the other. And this is also something where scholars have rethought um, earlier conceptions in recent decades. At some point, there was an idea of Judaism and Hellenism as kind of two separate entities, but then actually in in uh, yeah, recent decades, we have had several studies demonstrating how uh, how um, yeah, uh, Judaism in all uh, areas was in different ways uh, shaped by the wider Hellenistic uh, zeitgeist of the of the era and and um, it's yeah, Hellenism. It's not just about influence, but it's about a process of cultural collaboration and and this cultural collaboration took slightly different forms in in different uh, places, but but there was no uh, section of Judaism that somehow wouldn't have been uh, shaped by the by the wider Hellenistic media. And what you're saying now, uh, to which extent does this also affect our perception of the Qumran movement, which is something you started with in your work? Um, yeah. Have you have you different views on the this community today in light of what you're now saying about Hellenistic Judaism? Yeah, and I think this is a, an ongoing discussion in the field of Qumran studies or Dead Sea Scrolls studies. So, of course, the collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, 900 manuscripts, a uh, very rich collection, and and the back, backdrops or, or provenances of the text are, are various. So, so some um, just represent Second Temple Judaism broadly understood, but then some. Some of them come from a particular movement that is called Qumran movement in in scholarship and and yeah traditionally this movement has been understood as as being having tension with the Jerusalem uh, temple and and being yeah some kind of sectarian movement and because of this there was a long tendency to see the the Qumran movement. Um, uh, as somehow detach it from or opposing the the, the Hellenistic uh, culture of its time, but then in recent years we have had lots of re reconsiderations that actually show that the movement is is less peculiar uh, than people previously thought. And surely there were tensions between uh, different groups, and and they would have been critical of some things. But also in their thought and and practice, we have evidence for, for things that can only be explained by, by um, yeah, assuming that they were shaped by the, the wider Hellenistic zeitgeist and, and also absorbed and adopted uh, new ideas and practices uh, from the East as well as from the West. So, so this is again important that Hellenism, it's not just about uh, yeah, Greece, uh, or, or, or it's not just about Greek influence uh, coming to the east, but we have ideas moving around the ancient eastern Mediterranean region, uh, ideas coming from the east and also from the uh, west. And also my own work on the Dead Sea Scrolls and especially how I integrated them into my study on lived wisdom uh, has, has uh, tried to kind of reconsider the place of the Qumran movement in the wider uh, context of, of early Judaism. So, so when we look at the scrolls, we can see that it's a group that is uh, deeply dedicated to learning and study and the pursuit of a good life and, and perfection. And when we look at the ideal ways of living, how they're described in the scrolls, and if we compare those to, say, Greek Jewish accounts of, of the good life from the same period. So we can see that actually, um, of course, there are distinctive emphases here and there, but but overall, um, the same kind of, uh, yeah, wish to to pursue a life of perfection in a communal setting is also, also found elsewhere. So I think that this uh, consent for wisdom um, in the in the group, group is something that that is um, or needs to be taken into account when we rethink the place of the movement in the uh, yeah Hellenistic world. The Qumran community is above all known from its numerous manuscripts. In fact, this is why the Qumran community were, was discovered because we discovered the manuscripts. And in which ways was the practice of wisdom and the copying of manuscripts connected? Because you have pointed out how central the motive of wisdom is in this literature. Yeah. 
Yeah, so certainly we can see that it was a group that appreciated learning and, and scriber work and they would uh, produce text but also copy texts. So, so it was integral to their um, idea of, of um, uh, yeah, uh, an ideal way of, of living, learning and, and dealing with texts. And, and then when it comes to the role of wisdom texts uh, within the group's thought, so I think this is also where changes are, are happening. So many of the so-called wisdom instructions from Qumran, so they are kind of non-sectarian in character. So the provenances are probably not in the Qumran movement. Some might be, but in many cases, they come from late second temple Jewish sources, probably, probably understood. No, late second temple Jewish circles broadly understood. And because of this, there was perhaps a tendency for a long time, as pointed out by George Brooke, to, to see the a uh, huge amount of uh, wisdom literature that we have in the collection as somehow a little bit separate from the from the group's uh, key aims or, or concerns. But, but this is something, of course, that needs to be rethought and, and reconsidered because, um, yeah, it, the fact that they produced and preserved uh, such a big amount of literature concerned with uh, wisdom shows that, that it was uh, important to them and, and, and we should really acknowledge uh, that dimension of their uh, thought in a way that has not always been done. I would like to bring up the issue of, of gender also in the context of Qumran, because if, as you have shown, that wisdom was also in a way a way of life. Uh, it also included women and women's way of life. So um, I wonder a bit uh, about the issues of, of uh, uh, perfection and purity. Um, how available was this for women? Yeah. And uh, could women be teachers of wisdom? And in which ways could women be teachers of wisdom? In general, in the Jewish uh, tradition, so, so wisdom has a gendered aspect in the sense that the Hebrew word uh, for wisdom, chokhmah, like the Greek sophia, is actually a feminine concept. So if we look at the Hebrew Bible, wisdom is portrayed as a female figure, as a woman. So, so as a sort of transcendent figure who, who is thought to have existed uh, before the rest of the creation. So, so, so wisdom has a huge uh, importance in the, in the Jewish thought. But then when we look at many of the wisdom instructions, they come from elite uh, strata of the society, upper strata of the society, and they are meant at educating uh, young men. So, so then there is often very kind of patriarchal context and it's instruction delivered by fathers to, to sons and that's one yeah where one might ask whether there is a place for for women in the in the wisdom tradition but but already in the Hebrew Bible we do have various hints as at, hints at uh, women as teachers or mothers as teachers and it makes sense in that the maturity of um, education in the ancient world, it was not institutionalized in the same way as it is today. So home was an important place of learning and therefore mothers would have um, special roles as well. When it comes to the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, movement, also scholarly conceptions have shifted there. So in the early research, the group was seen often as a celibate uh, group, maybe some kind of proto-monastic community this impression was perhaps influenced by the fact that many of the first Dead Sea Scrolls scholars were Roman Catholic monks, and maybe they were also projecting their own lifestyle to the material that they were studying. But then when we look at the Scrolls collection as a whole, and we can see that uh, actually women and children were also part of the movement, uh, it's debated whether part, a section of the movement would have been celibate, but certainly not the uh, whole movement, which also included uh, women and, and children. And we have occasional glimpses so of, for instance, instruction in the context of marriage uh, directed at women. But maybe one aspect of women's wisdom that has been overlooked um, is this purity that you, you mentioned. So when we look at the scrolls, there is a lot of focus on, on kind of life of holiness and purity. And of course, uh, if we think of ritual purity in the Jewish tradition, so it's very important for, for women to, uh, as well as, as men, to, to perform uh, yeah, certain practices um, in order to, to uh, yeah, uh, 
retain uh, ritual purity. So, so in this sense, if we acknowledge uh, purity issues as part of the uh, ideal way of living or, or, or their idea of, of, of the perfect life, so, so we can certainly see that women play a crucial role in the performance of um, the ideal lifestyle. And then also at the same time with the scrolls, we have, for instance, file of Alexandria, the Jewish philosopher. Uh, he has a treatise on a Jewish group of philosophers, the Therapeuti, uh, and this group includes both men and women philosophers. So, so maybe in the upper strata of the society in, say, in Roman Alexandria, uh, some women uh, might have had opportunities for, for higher learning as well. Your work has changed quite a lot over the years, from your dissertation work on on uh, on Qumran and then broadening out to wisdom, and now broadening out even more to uh, to most areas of the ancient Mediterranean, but focusing on some particular topics and and perspectives. So. So, uh, having now described these various phases of your work, um, how do you think your work has changed? Yeah, it has evolved. Um, as I said, I kind of started with uh, quite traditional historical critical work and philological work. And, and um, yeah, this was uh, the tradition in which I was brought up. And, and I'm grateful for the tradition because I, I, I value the skills that I learned from that work. I know how to work with an ancient manuscript. I don't take uh, a modern edition for granted, for instance. So, so it was uh, important, but then I also, I have lots of interests in life and, and, and I think it's just natural that we, we uh, expand and, and develop as scholars. And, and, and that's certainly, yeah, I can see a transition towards more maybe thematic or topical investigations in my, in my work. And also, as I told, I was originally interested in the comparative science of religion when I came to university. And now I may be also discovering uh, some of those uh, questions um, that, and approaches that, that have uh, emerged from, from that field. And as well as, yeah, for instance, gender studies and bringing them into conversation with my you know, philological uh, background. So, so I, I don't see different approaches as mutually exclusive. And I would also, yeah, I, I want my work to be historical and descriptive in orientation, but then I'm also happy to make use of, of um, new approaches. And, and um, of course, I mean, it depends on the question that I'm asking, uh, the approach that I need to to choose, so I'm certain that in the future as well, I'm going to to go to new new directions that I'm not aware of yet. These other perspectives uh, we have talked about intersectionality and and gender, and they are in a way questions from our own time um, that we we uh, we study in a contemporary way, but also questions that scholars working with ancient materials take. Uh, to the ancient materials. So we ask questions in a way uh, and look for answers in the past. Doesn't this uh, include some level of anachronism? Yes, we need a constant process of um, deconstruction. So, so we've already talked much about canon and how it doesn't really make sense in the ancient context. Also say idea of Judaism and Christianity as two separate entities uh, could be contested. Uh, even basic things like like book, uh, idea of book, book could be a uh, question. So we've already talked a little bit about the scrolls. And, and now when we think of text, we think of book, we think of an author, uh, place of publication, year of publication, but ancient authors, um, they operated with a very different uh, uh, f framework. So there was no idea of individual authorship or, or copyright in antiquity. And, and therefore, to even talk about text or textuality, we really need to to um, deconstruct our own ideas of of uh, text writing and and authorship. So, so in that sense, um, yeah, the, the danger of anachronism is there, and and we need to uh, be very careful uh, when we use various uh, concepts and and um, to, to think whether they actually make sense. So, for example, the book of Isaiah that has gone through several editorial stages could perhaps be more compared to a modern hypertext on the internet than a book authored by 
one author only is is uh, you know we can also find positive analogies in the present absolutely yeah and this is actually something uh where scholars working on book history um or they have commented on this that in many ways the ancient uh ideas of authorship they're closer to digital writing and for instance wikipedia type of authorship than they are to the printed book cultures so i think it's the idea of a printed book with copyrights and author and publication yeah, and publisher that that's the the difficult part but then actually some of these uh yeah most recent uh forms of authorship and writing as exemplified by wikipedia so so those might be actually closer to the uh, ancient textual landscape hmm. Um, I would like to uh, close this section on some reflections on, on biblical studies as a discipline. Um, I, I, I wonder a little bit about uh, the place of biblical studies um, uh, and studies in, in, in Jewish and Christian sources more, more generally. The reason I wonder about this is that it is noticeable that the last couple of years we have had two Nils Klim winners from a relatively small area. Um, and uh, I wonder if you have some reflections on, um, on how this discipline then contributes and strengthens you as a scholar. Yeah, first of all, yeah, so, so our field, um, it's inherently interdisciplinary and it could be done in various different contexts. So, so biblical studies is often found in the department of theology or study of religion, but it could also be in Near Eastern studies or history or, or philosophy department. So that also shows um, that the there are scholars uh, who, who identify a bit differently in terms of their disciplinary context or, or identity, but we're still working with the same material and having this conversation. So I think it, um, yeah, speaks for the, for the, yeah, mobility of our field and how how we could be. Uh, yeah, f found in different contexts. But here in Nordic countries, uh, the study of ancient Jewish and Christian materials typically uh, takes place in the faculties or, or, or departments of um, uh, theology. And I think in Nordic countries, the situation has been, has been um, yeah, very good in, in recent decades. So, so Nordic scholars have been uh, yeah, ready to, to yeah, deconstruct canonical boundaries and move on to work with new, with new materials, not just with the Dead Sea Scrolls, but also, for instance, with Nakamadi codices. So, so I think they've been kind of sensitive to, to trends that are, um, uh, to, to the trends of the field uh, more broadly understood. And because of that, they have been also able to, to win big uh, grants. So, so we have also at the moment uh, many big uh, projects funded either by ERC or, or by national funding bodies uh, in, in all, all Nordic countries. And, and I think, um, yeah, that kind of teamwork and, and the synergies that it has enabled, it's quite distinctive because the field of, because our field, it is still, if you think globally, it's quite a solitary field. So there is still in many places of an idea of an individual scholar who, who works on his or her own and comes up with ideas or readings of a text. But I think that in Nordic countries, we have been uh, quite pioneering in our field in the sense that there have been more collaborative uh, modes of doing scholarship and and uh, research groups where people work in themes and think together and and write together and and I'm sure that that has also um, affected the the success that various um, scholars in our field have had in in Nordic countries in terms of for instance being able to to yeah uh, win research funding. In our preparations for this conversation, you also mentioned the issue of trust mm -hmm. and how important trust is for the success of these projects. Yeah, yeah. well, maybe in, in general, um, 
if I think of, of faculties of or departments of theology in other countries. So I have a sense that that we are uh, trusted by our societies, that, that we are doing rigorous um, uh, yeah, non-confessional study of, of religious traditions and that there is a place for that in the in the contemporary academia and and we're taking taken seriously so so i think we have the kind of societal support for for doing what we do uh in the in the university of course there are challenges as well so so for instance if i think of the erc funding structure so and the panels that they have and the subfields so so there is no niche for say biblical scholars or theologians so in that sense we also have to argue and be able to demonstrate our relevance and we have to be able to to uh, to communicate the relevance of, of our research to a wider cross-disciplinary audience if we want to to continue to operate but but i personally don't see that as a problem because as i said the field is inherently interdisciplinary in orientation. You can't study ancient texts, ancient Jewish or Christian texts, if you also are not interested in other texts and material objects from the ancient world. And in terms of method, uh, we can't uh, study these texts if we don't also follow what's going on in other fields in humanities and social sciences and, and bring uh, theories and approaches developed elsewhere into conversation with our ancient materials so so i'm um yeah hopeful that it's uh, possible in the in the future as well even if we maybe maybe can't take can't take our um place for granted and maybe the the volume in which we do our work is not the same as it was 50 years ago in terms of amount of of um jobs at universities for instance but but certainly yeah this this yeah, the challenges we have they're also something we we share with many other people in humanities for instance in in classics so the challenges in a way makes us better yeah i think it, it does in the sense that we can't like uh yeah we have to actively think that what, what, what we're doing and, and and how how to communicate uh the relevance of what we uh do to to a wider audience of scholars so i think it keeps us awake we have talked about bringing uh, modern perspectives, modern questions um, into the ancient world uh, and whether our questioning then becomes anachronistic. But then we also have many people around us who maybe have not studied these texts as carefully as you have, and they um, would like, for example, an ancient perspective on wisdom or they would like a biblical perspective on marriage or some other topic mm -hmm. um, how how uh, have do you have thoughts on how we can take our knowledge of the past into conversation with the world in which we live and different ways of doing that mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be a, a challenge because the Hebrew Bible, it's not a systematic treatise. It's a library, it's a collection of texts. We have both prose and uh, poetry there and, and various perspectives on, on, on each topic and, and multiple voices sometimes competing with each other. So if we take some contemporary questions, say uh, migration or, or gender or, or racism, so, so we would have a wide uh, variety of, of viewpoints. So, so we have texts that um, exhort people to take care of strangers, but then we also have xenophobic texts. And 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 the, it's very difficult to give a biblical perspective on something as, as modern readers uh, might sometimes be hoping. But despite the, the difficulty of the task, I think we, it's important for us also to, to bring this text into conversation with contemporary audiences and contemporary readers and struggling with contemporary phenomenon because we are also in many ways uh, building on them consciously or unconsciously and and um, say biblical literature it also continues to be generative uh, around the world it continues to to give rise to new forms of culture of course in in various religious communities but also more broadly for instance in in art and other yeah artistic expression so uh, yeah we, we certainly uh, need to to create those conversations even though uh, it's more complicated than some might think. Well, thank you, Elisa Usimeki, and congratulations again with the Nils Klim Prize. Thank you very much.